25 on the ballot and we're going to repeal it and defend the right to public workers. Well, I have some questions of you. Is, are you ready to end war and poverty? Are you ready for an America where there are jobs for all? Are you ready for an America where there is health care for all? Are you ready for an American where there is housing for all? Yes. Are you ready for an America where there is education for all? Yes. Are you ready for an America where there is retirement security for all? Yes. Are you ready for an America which stands for peace? Yes. Well, then I know I'm in the right place. Hello, Wisconsin. We're told that God must love the poor people. He's made so many of them. But we know, we know the deeper truth. We know that 14 million Americans out of work and another 8 million Americans underemployed represents an economy that has caused wealth to be accelerated to the top and that is increasingly moving away from de democratic principles. We know that we can have jobs for all. We know that in an economy where we see tens of millions of people without health care, where even health care reform within the context of a for-profit system recognizes there are many people who will never have the care they need, we know that's insufficient. We see that over 6.5 million people are still to lose their homes. We understand there are so many young people for whom the dream of a college education is becoming more and more elusive. We know that retire, retired persons are being told after they've worked 20, 30, 40 years on the job that the retirement benefits that they counted on will not be there. We know our government is looking at ways of trying to limit Social Security and we're being told, well, the money's just not there. Let me tell you something. I'm going to lay out a plan for you that's different than anything that you've heard, but it's something that absolutely can work. I learned today that the Federal Reserve the Federal Reserve has given countless money now to European banks to prop them up. We know that a couple weeks ago it was revealed that the Federal Reserve created $1.2 trillion out of nothing and gave it to American banks and some foreign banks to help prop them up. We know the United States taxpayers gave $700 billion to bail out the banks. We know there was always money for Wall Street but not money for Main Street or money for small businesses. Let me tell you something. In 1913, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed, it privatized the money power. It took the money power away from the people. In the Constitution of the United States, under Article, section, uh, Article 1, Section 8, the power to coin or create money was vested in the Congress, in the Constitution. But the 1913 Federal Reserve Act privatized the money supply. It created the Federal Reserve, and when it did that, it essentially separated money from the people, and it started a, a, a new type of economic system, which we're experiencing the terminal stages of today, which results in war and unemployment, which results in war and poverty. It is time for us to reclaim the essential power that is moving the tides of the world, and that is the money power. And we do it by taking the Fed and putting it back under the United States Treasury so we can reclaim the power of the people. You remember that fractional reserve banking has enabled banks to pyramid their assets. You take out a loan from the bank, they can create eight or nine dollars out of that. But what's happened is banks pyramid it their assets to the, by 20, 30 times or more, and we, the taxpayers, got stuck with the losses, of, 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 losses from bad investments of banks who were too big to fail. If you look today at banking in America, and you see where it was a few years ago, imagine it in terms of the NCAA brackets, where there might be 64 teams, and then there's 32 teams, and then there's 16 teams. Well, banking has just shrunk. There's, the number of banks have shrunk. 
and the economic power has been concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. But the Federal Reserve is helping, to helping these mergers and acquisitions to go along, and the banks are parking money. They park money at the Federal Reserve, gain interest on it at the same time they wouldn't loan money to Main Street businesses. There is a racket going on in this country. It, it is beyond anything that most people can imagine. But the legislation that I will be preparing, not just preparing, I'm going to introduce into, into Congress next week, called the NEED Act. The National, Economic, the National Economic Emergency Employment Act. This act will put the Fed under the Treasury and fractional reserve banking so we're not exposed to these massive bank losses and it'll do something else that will change this country and at last give us the ability to reclaim this country. It will enable the government to be able to invest in creating jobs, in, in putting millions of people back to work. We can have a full employment economy. We can't have jobs for all. We can't put America back to work. People say, well, this is just some crazy pipe dream. Let me tell you something. The craziness is when we're told, or we are expected to accept a country where 14 million people are out of work. Where we just say, well, you know, that's just the way it is. No, it's not the way it is. We're being driven into poverty where the wealth is concentrating to the top. The fundamental issue of our time, the, the radical redistribution of wealth upwards. And what's happened here in Wisconsin in the attack on public workers is an aspect of that. We have to understand that if we can end the power of the Fed by putting it back under the control of Treasury, if we can end fractional reserve banking and get the government to be able to invest, we can have a New Deal program where we can rebuild America's bridges, its water system, sewer system, our schools, put millions of Americans back to work, restore the economic vitality of our nation. The American people want work, not welfare, and there's enough work to be done. We have 2.2 trillion dollars in infrastructure needs repair, and it's about time that we reclaimed our ability to do it. Why should the government have to borrow money from banks in order to go ahead and rebuild America? Think about that. Think about that. The, why should the government have to borrow money from banks to rebuild America? The banks increasingly are moving their assets out of this country. And they are stripping America. They're strip mining America. And they're destroying the American dream. We, we also have to reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act. Yeah. It is long past the time. It is long past the time that we need to, to evaluate what happened as a result of Graham uh, Leach Bliley. We understand that once you took down the wall between commercial banks and investment banking, that led to the kind of sharp practices, predatory lending, the, the schemes on Wall Street that resulted in a subprime meltdown and the ruination of neighborhoods from my city in Cleveland all across the country with millions more faced with losing their homes. The only way we can have an honest society and a decent society is through regulation. And we've got to regulate these huge engines of, of our society, these economic engines. Ask yourself, when, when the bailout was going on, I raised the question about why are we talking about a bailout for banks and why aren't we talking about mortgage modification and enable everyone to stay in their homes? But well, we were told at that time, no, uh, you know, neither, 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 neither of the two candidates for president in 2008 wanted to do mortgage modification. And so what happened is that we end up in a situation where millions of people lose their homes and the banks get bailed out. They're made whole. There's something wrong in America. When the, when the essential part of the American dream, which is home ownership, is no longer a viable option for many Americans, where many families are doubling up just to survive, where people have found that they've gone underwater with their mortgages, where the house is worth uh, less, or, or it's worth, it, it, where they owe more than the house is worth. 
They're finding that they just will never be able to get caught up. What's happened to our country? Where this whole dream of a home is, is, is getting extinguished by, for so many millions of people. What's happening is that the banks are putting pressure and creating more and more foreclosures right now so that they can clean out their portfolio in the housing market and set the stage for another bubble. It is time that we got control of this monster on Wall Street. It's time that we put Glass-Steagall back. It's time that we broke up the monopolies in banking. It's time that we reclaim our country from the money power. There's no need for poverty in America. There's no need for people to be living in the street, for people to be wandering, unemployed. We need to restore our country. So many college students are, ha are faced right now with not being able to pay back their loans. You graduate, you can't find a job. We have conned a generation of young people into thinking, go to college, get prepared, there'll be a job at the end. No, there's not. What they have at the end of those four or six or seven years is a big bill. And then they get, then they get done by bill collectors when they don't have the ability to repay. And then they're stuck with debt for the next 10, 15, 20 years of, of their lives. With, with a change in monetary policy in this country, we can have education for every young person guaranteed a college education. This is a basic right in a democratic society. How do you maintain a democracy if you do not have an educated citizenry? This is a basic right, and we ought to be mobilizing and rallying with the young people in defense of their right to have a college education. number of years. Remember a few years ago when Wall Street was just drooling at the thought that they could privatize a portion of Social Security and after the market dropped, could you have imagined what it would have been like where senior citizens would have found out that the value of their Social Security retirement benefits were cut in half? Indeed, that's what's happened to many people already. So many public workers across this country who were told year, for years and years you put in 30 years on a job, you're going to have guaranteed pensions. Well, that's not happening. We have to have a pension system that restores at full power the pension rights of every single worker in America who was made a promise. That's a promise by a city. That's a promise by a county. That's a promise by a state. That's a promise by a nation. That's a promise that binds the generation. That's a promise that restores people to the fullness of life. That's a promise that people should have fulfilled in their senior year. We're not going to send seniors back to the poorhouse in the United States of America. Social Security for all. And in our time, especially since the tragedy of 9-11, we've been told to expect that war will be a permanent feature of our life. Indeed, in today's Wall Street Journal, there's a debate going on among high and high-ranking echelons of the administration as to whether or not they have the ability to wage endless war against individuals from 10,000 feet or against small groups of people from 10,000 feet using striking with predator missiles anywhere in the world. It is time to stop this madness of permanent warfare. It is time to end the war in Iraq and bring our troops home. It is time to end the war in Afghanistan and bring our troops home. It is time to end the war against Libya, against Pakistan, against the rest of the world. It's time to close the U.S. bases. Stop spending money on war. Invest the money here at home. We are told that war is inevitable, 
peace is inevitable, and we have leaders who are willing to go and negotiate to explore what FDR called the science of human relations. We have to have the capacity to understand that the world has changed, that the impulse of the world, the, the guiding, underlying impulse of the world is towards human unity. There is an awareness that people have everywhere that we are all one, that we are interconnected and interdependent. And our government acts as though it is not aware that the world has changed, that we're not the, 17th, the 18th or 19th century America and where some of our leaders went around the globe looking for dragons to slay. We've been warned about that. We've been warned about the dangers of permanent war. We've been warned about the military-industrial complex. And now's the time we have to show our government that we will not stand for a continuation of these wars, which is stripping our country of the ability to meet the needs of the American people here at home. And these wars, and the wars, and the wars became our nation. Stop the military-industrial complex. Stop a state of war. Stop a state of siege on our civil liberties, which comes with war. Stop the poverty, which comes with war. that's being made by those who have fashioned themselves or fancied themselves as captains of industry have essentially been lies to the American people. We were told that if we would approve free trade, that there would be more jobs in America. But the passage of NAFTA, GATT, and the WTO cost American, Americans millions of jobs and set the stage for driving down wages. It is long past the time that we should stand up and demand that our representatives vote to repeal NAFTA, repeal GATT, get out of the WTO, have an American manufacturing policy where the maintenance of steel, automotive, and aerospace is seen as vital for our national security, have a worse green administration where we rebuild America's technological capabilities, Stop these trade laws which precipitate a race to the bottom, which wipe out workers' rights, wipe out human rights, wipe out environmental quality principles. We are sick and tired of this race to the bottom. It's time for us to start a race to the top, to the top, where we have jobs and wage increases, where we have pension benefits, where we have retirement security. It's time we had a government which took control of the levers of power and put them back in the hands of the American people. You told me a moment ago you want health care for all. And we've been told, well, you know, that's not possible because $2.6 trillion dollars a year goes for health care in America and their costs keep rising. But what they won't face is the fact that one out of every three of those dollars goes for the activity of the for-profit system, for corporate profits, stock options, executive salary, advertising, marketing, the cost of paperwork, and this private health care system, create a public health care system, give people more control over their health care, help to bring forward alternative health care, help to bring forward nutrition, and the need for health care, give people more control of their own destiny, and give us control over these insurance companies by eliminating private insurance as the main way that we provide health care for the American people. What kind of a world do we want? That's really the essential question. What kind of a world do we want? We, we have an opportunity here to create, not just create a vision of what can be, but to summon our collective energies and, and grab that vision and bring it into ourselves and working with others, create a new America that we know is possible. 
Here in Madison, you're the beating heart of a new movement of public awareness, which gives people a belief that maybe we can change it all. You here in Madison represent the potential for a dramatic breakthrough, an evolutionary breakthrough in the type of government we have. You know, those who study biological evolution would track evolution and they see at some point a species had a sudden break. It's called punctuated equilibrium. They just break and transform into something else. But let me tell you something. What we have in this room is the energy to create a qualitative transformation in effect an evolutionary break that's social and economic, that we can become the very people that we are, are waiting for. We are, that's who we are. And, and we have to understand that comes through an understanding of the innate power of the human spirit. When I hear, as I was backstage and I heard these voices merge in, in cries for social and economic justice, I could feel it. That, there was, that there's something at work here. There's something about the spirit of America that's at work here in Madison and in Wisconsin and in Ohio and across the country. There is a, a percolation of a new energy, an awareness of that, that the way things are do not have to be. It was, it was Tennyson who wrote so many years ago, he said, come my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. So let us seek a newer world through the power of the human heart, through the power of human unity, through the power of the human spirit, and through harnessing the power of organized labor and working to transform the social and economic landscape of America. I know we can do it. I'm with you in doing it. Let's call forth our highest potential. Let's bring forth our greatest energy. Let's do it with a sense of joy. Let's do it with a sense of courage. Let's do it with a sense of love. Let's do it with a sense of, of something we can accomplish. Let's do it and do it in a way that future generations will say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Dennis!